Okay. All right. Well, welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jen Sanders from Calvert Woodley and we're so excited to be able to bring you this virtual tasting and tour. Um, I wish I could be there. It looks beautiful and um, but we're so glad to have Luca and you can see Michael Sands is next to him. Um, so tonight we are tasting three or four wines dependent on which pack that you bought. The first being the Fiano, the second being a Fiano Reserve, the Viognier Reserve, the Cabernet Franc Reserve. And then if you bought the four pack, then you're having their flagship wine, the Octagon. Uh, it's a beautiful day and Luca wanted to show off the vineyards. And um, without further ado, I, I had an intro written, but it's so beautiful there. And I know they have a lot to say that I just think I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Michael Sands from Calvert Woodley, the owner, and Luca. So please go ahead. Thank you, Jen. And uh, you're right. You you should wish that you were here. It's it's unbelievable. This is my first time here, and I can guarantee you it's not my last. It's really really great. And I want to thank Luca Pasquina, the winemaker, and uh, uh, basically been here for over 30 years, and he he runs the place. And I can see why he wanted to live here. It's really really a stunning place and and i encourage you to, to take the almost two hour drive from from where we are in dc uh, it'll be well worth it so I, I thank you for joining us and and i hope you enjoy well good evening to all of you thank you for tuning in my name is luca paschina i'm a third generation winemaker uh, from uh, the northwest of italy but oh hold on hold on a second before i go back hey christy come down yeah come over hi guys So happy to be here today. I have to take off my high heels. But I look good up. Good to see you. Good to Welcome. see you too. How are you? Nice to see you. Hi, Michael Sam. Yeah. Hi, Chrissy Dillard. Thank you so much. I have to tell you, you and I have both done a ton of virtual events yep. since April, probably combined like 150. But this is the first one where not only are people hearing us talk and getting wine in at home, but we're actually in the vineyard. So we're raising the bar yet again, oh, right? right? Right. So Luca, yeah. this is a gorgeous property. We are about what, 20 minutes outside of Charlottesville? Yes. Yeah. And you have 900 acres, right? Yeah. How many of those acres are planted to grapes? Out of 900, we have uh, 180 acres that are prime uh, land for grapes. The mm -hmm. rest of the farm, actually it's, uh, uh, it goes into big meadows and we have a lot of forestry. We manage a lot of forestry. We have some cattle, we have hay fields. Mm -hmm. We raise some birch or hogs. So it's a working farm and a vineyard at the same time. So we Hey William, we're having a little issues with the, um, with the audio there. So we can't hear what just happened. It kind of went out. Hold on one second. How about, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. So please Great. repeat repeat the last part of what you were just saying. Um, oh. <laughs> it kind of cut out. So I'm gonna go mute myself again and you go for it. Okay, great. So I was saying, um, we are here at Barbersville uh, about 20 minutes outside of Charlottesville. Yes. And there are about 900 acres, but how many acres are actually planted to vine? Right, so 900 acre, we have 180 in vine. Yeah, and we uh, actually among this what, this 180 are the prime land for growing. As you, as most people know, grapes they are very particular about certain type of soil and slopes and water retention, you name it. But the rest of the farm is not just kept uh, just idle. It's important for us to create a lot of biodiversity on the estate. Therefore, we do some farming. We have some hay fields, we, which we only cut once a year that I've never seen any any herbicide, any fertilizer. So basically they're like meadows. They also do things growing there. We also have several lakes and then we have a lot of forestry that we manage. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's a very uh, vital and working farm. It's like you're staying a vineyard. Yeah. It, it's amazing, William. I don't know if you can pan out, but just to see the long lingering hillsides, it's, you feel like you're more in Tuscany. Yes, indeed. You know? uh, when people ask me what this reminds me the most of, it is Tuscany for sure, because in Tuscany, actually, you do have 
areas where you have grape growing and then a lot of land that is preserved as forestry. Mm -hmm. And there are these uh, this, uh, mountain hills, I would I yeah. call them. Yeah. So here we really have, uh, we're surrounded by, just behind us is the Southwest Mountain, it's a huge ridge. We have the only vineyard along the Southwest Mountain is tens of thousands of acres so mm -hmm. bordering our estate. I don't know if you know this, but I got engaged here. Yes, I do. But the reason. So my husband, Ross, I told him we were so young. I was 24 and I was 20 years ago. I told him that I wanted to get engaged in Italy, but we didn't have enough money. So he did research and he found this property. This is before I sold barbershop, before I sold wine wholesale. Yeah. I was selling flowers. He did his research. And the reason he proposed here is because we couldn't afford Italy. So he drove me down and surprised me with a proposal right there. Isn't awesome. that cool? Yes. And I got married <laughs> in front of that building in 1992. So, so we're referring to <laughs> the ruins. So yeah. just for a sec, and not only is this like one of the most amazing places, but you have history here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the ruins and the connection with Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a um, it's a it's a it's a big property, and uh, and uh, in the early 1800 was owned by, owned by a governor in Virginia, mm -hmm. and the governor had a desire to build a, a, a very nice mansion, and uh, he actually engaged with Thomas Jefferson, which was a good friend, mm -hmm. and they were into politics together those in those years. And so they designed this beautiful, Jefferson designed this beautiful building, which was built between 1814 and 1821. Mm -hmm. And then actually the, the governor lived there. He died there in 1842. 1884, the house burns due to a right. chimney fire. Mm -hmm. Only the walls are remaining. It's a, and it's a ruin. Mm -hmm. And we are preserving it as a ruin and actually has a great architectural features, the same that you find in Monticello. But also Jefferson was an enophile and he really mm -hmm. attempted to grow grapes in Virginia mm -hmm. many, many, many times. Mm -hmm. uh, he never was able to uh, make a bottle of wine, he laments. By the way, those grapes were of European uh, origin, like uh, he planted Pinot Noir, he planted uh, uh, Chasselas Doré, he planted uh, Sangiovese. Never was able to make a bottle of wine. Yeah. So we have to go from his last planting in 1807 Mm -hmm. all the way to 1976 when an Italian family finally uh, from Italy, from the Veneto, the Zonin family, they have several estates also in Tuscany, Puglia, Sicily, Piemonte. The founder, uh, Mr. Mr. Gianni Zonin, comes to the U.S. with a desire to plant a vineyard in the U.S. and travels to Napa Valley, Central Valley, Finger Lakes, and Virginia. And picks. And picks yeah. Virginia because to him, he felt that actually the climate was right, the soil was right. Nobody had ever produced a great bottle of wine from a vinifera variety like so Malor. Mm -hmm. So, and he also always had a very much a pioneer mind. Yeah. Also in Italy, he planted grapes in Erin, Sicily, nobody was there, not a lot of people out there, and same thing in Maremma. Mm -hmm. So, I say this is it. And so, I just they start planting. And, uh, so, and then I met them in 1990 and uh, they hired me. And he to, scooped you up and he never gave me back. I never came back. He never, never gave me back. back. I, go back at, I go back at a, at a tourist in Italy. It's perfect. Exactly. I'm going to go see your mom soon. Yes. So let's walk over to one of the vineyards. Um, this is Cabernet Franc. Yeah, we're in a vineyard Cabernet Franc. It's just a small three acre parcel. Although uh, the remaining of the vineyard are predominantly actually to the south side of the state along the slopes of the uh, Goodlow Mountain. And uh, <clears throat> here is only a small part. You can see now the clusters actually, they, start, they just start blooming. You see those little pistols. Mm -hmm. They don't have a glamorous bloom. Actually, they don't have much scent at all. They self pollinate. So they, we don't need bees, we don't need wind. All we need really is not too much water during bloom. It will, it will the dilute. The, nutrition, the, the nutrients in the sap that flows through the cluster. And if they don't have the right, uh, the right percentages of, uh, of nutrients, they may abort and you may have some berries that they fall. But right here, for example, like this called, like we call milking the, the cluster, all it comes down is pistols. You don't see the berries like those. Mm -hmm. In a year where there's a lot of rain, if you do this, you start seeing a lot of oh. these guys. And, mm -hmm. That will mean that the, that the cluster, instead of having 170 berries, like on Cabernet Franc, you might only have 120. So 
for us is great. The season has been fantastic. We have great, uh, we haven't got any significant rain here in five weeks. We have some rain coming this weekend, so I couldn't ask for anything better. You know, it's the most beautiful day. So let's talk a little about the soil. Yeah. So this is a very common soil type in Virginia. <laughs> yeah, the soil in Virginia, we have a lot of red clay, mm -hmm. which actually it, it originates from a sedimentary rock in the, that it's in the, it's in the family of the serpentine uh, group, mm -hmm. which is actually the greenstone. Sure. This greenstone through a process that takes a long time, basically, it oxidizes. As it oxidizes <clears throat> from green, it turns red. Mm -hmm. and it expands 1.7 times its volume. So all this clay, it generates from this, uh, mainly from this greenstone. And as it builds up, then organic matter uh, comes into place and the vine basically here are feeding on a combination of uh, different uh, rock mm -hmm. of different sizes, intermediate with a lot of clay. It's a soil that really is loved by certain varieties. In general, uh, this type of soil produces white wine, with very intense aromatic and very delicate with long aging potential. When it comes to red, it's a bit more difficult for some varietals, like Cabernet Sauvignon for us. It could actually, it's uh, very intermittent, the quality of Cabernet Sauvignon. We can make a great vintage every two, every 10 years. Other vintages are, is, a, is a good Cabernet Sauvignon, but we don't price it more than a certain amount of, because it's just not worth more than that. Although when it comes to Merlot, Franc, Petit Verdot, and Nebbiolo, it really produces magnificent wines with high consistencies. I would say at eight every 10 vintages, we can really make a great uh, wine from those varieties I just mentioned. That's a really high rate of success it is a high in, rate. A wine, in a wine growing I, I come, I grew up in Piemonte. I'm a third generation winemaker. My father, my uncle, also my brother are winemakers. And uh, Piemonte is very similar. We have a year that is a lot of uh, a bit more rainy, a bit colder. We have a year that's very dry, mm -hmm. and so for me it was nothing very different moving from Piemonte to come here and grow grapes here. And so we don't irrigate. We only irrigate in case there is a very severe drought, like 2010, 98, 2001. In that case, we draw water from our lakes, and then we just go through with a big tank, and we just give a few gallons. To each, to each vine and so we, we just keep them yeah. from uh, and they go under a little bit of stress and that's okay. Yields stress a bit is good lower. for, for yeah. grapevines. Yields apply. a little lower and the, grape, uh, the wines are more intense but it's definitely a great soil. Did I hear today that your brother owns a restaurant near Piazza Duomo? Yeah my brother uh, started as a winemaker himself like, like me uh -huh. and then he worked for two great producers in Piemonte and then after five years of winemaking he chose to change completely career open a a very authentic trattoria in downtown Alba and is very close to Piazza del Duomo, close to some Michelin style restaurants. Very different style, very traditional. I can't wait to go. And uh, I'm going there at the end of the month, visiting my mother. I haven't seen my mom in a year and a half. So I'm ready. Uh, I bet. I bet you are. Um, so uh, this particular vineyard um, is surrounded by uh, rose bushes. And this is something that you see uh, in winemaking regions around the world. Yours are particularly beautiful. You know, I'm a flower person. Yeah. But um, what's the reason uh, when you see roses planted at the end of rows? Why? why? Right. Well, it's a, traditionally in winemaking, in grape growing, in, especially in the region of France, I say, uh, there was a tradition to plant roses at the end of rows, not necessarily at the end, at the end of each row but they would have roses in very in proximity to the grapes because they are much more uh, easily affected by powdery mildew, which is a, is a, is a, it's also, also called white rust. It makes a, a it really makes a sheen. It makes a sheen on the leaves uh, of a really, a uh, little like, no, it's okay. That's fine. A, a little bit like a, uh, almost like flower. Mm -hmm. And so uh, by getting this disease before the vine, couple of days, it gives you a signal that you should, you should spray sulfur on, on, on the vineyard so the vines will not get the, the, this disease. Which is a very common sulfur is a natural product yes. and it's one of yep. the most used compounds. Very in effective, winery. very effective and it doesn't, it doesn't really you. hurt the environment and is very effectively used. Yeah. It's like the canary in the coal mine. Yeah, yeah. same thing. So let's go ahead and walk yes. up. I'm sure people are thirsty. If you haven't opened your wine, please open, please start drinking. Don't wait for us. So in terms of Virginia, Virginia now has over 300 wineries. Yes. 
And in the 70s, it was like 35. So to think about that arch. Actually, in 76, there were five wineries. And Barbersville is number five. Number five. So you, you all are when really... I, when I arrived in 1990, there were about 48 wineries. And today, I've 300. There was a big, uh, a big growth, especially in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And then every decade, they're just getting bigger and bigger actually it's really quite incredible you know I, when i was doing that um uh let's start with wine with jay yeomans the master of wine instead of the gala this year for virginia i i said to people you know we keep talking about the virginia wine industry like it's like it's an infant and we're, we're no longer in our infancy it's a very uh it's a thriving yeah. thriving industry definitely virginia uh, and all the winemakers like myself that have been here over three decades. And I also we have a lot of uh, very young, talented winemakers from, from France, from South Africa, from the West Coast, from Virginia, of course, uh, from Italy. So it's really a great time for Virginia because it's maturing. And actually, after 32 years, I actually am now starting to do some very small changes, like I'm taking away few little blocks here and there mm -hmm. because I have learned that I can do I can use that piece of land better. Right. I'm not talking about removing all the vineyard part, but just kind of using best your resources. Uh, what really controls the future of this place is it's mainly the land that you cannot change. Sure. So it's my duty as a winemaker literally to do all these things for the next generation of winemakers. So I'm very proud of be able to do that. It's very cool that you get to do that too, because a lot of um, a lot of wineries have to bring in consultants because they have such high turnover, and you have the working knowledge. So you're not you're not hearing from someone what you should do. Right. You've been in the vineyards, and you are very very active in your vineyards. I am, which I love. I, of course, it's not just myself. I have a very valuable uh, collaborator, Fernando Franco, for example. He's uh, from Salvador. Sure. He has been growing grapes in Virginia since 1983. Yeah. I hired him in 1998. Yeah. And then I, uh, now I have an associate winemaker from Friuli. Yeah. Uh, been here 13 years with me. Yeah. So if you combine the three of us, it's 80 yeah. years of, of factory of work in this, in, in, in this region. He's not just a pretty face, guys. That's what I'm saying. Not just a pretty face. <laughs> Cheers to you. <laughs> so let's yeah. go ahead and talk about the 2017 Piano. Yes. So what do you look for, first of all, in a great Piano? Well, perhaps I'd like to turn a little bit the question, if sure. you allow me. Yeah. I chose to plant Piano uh, strictly because I do like particularly that this varietal is great. It produces very elegant wine and uh, very floral. Uh, compare, for example, to maybe uh, Falangina, which is another grape from that region. Siano, I find it a more delicate wine, a more soothing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I remember somebody, uh, actually, um, Dave McIntyre from the Washington oh, Post. I love Dave uh, McIntyre. I, I was talking to him, great friend. I said, look, if you were, if you were able to describe Siano with one word, what would that be? And I, and I thought, and I answer a pillow, uh, something that really uh, it's, it caresses you. It, it's, it's, uh, it has some, this roundness, it's delicate, it's delicate, by no means it's sweet, no means it's sweet, it's mineral, but it has a very gentle uh, a tone. I didn't uh, know for sure it was going to work here, but the logic was there. We've been growing Vermentino since 2009. And it's a grape that really likes warm to hot weather conditions. In fact, in, in Sardinia, it's grown in areas in central, central part of Sardinia. They go to 110, 115 every year. Really? And the wine still is very fresh yeah. and it doesn't suffer. That actually thrives for that. Huh. Fiano is, is a similar grape. It's grown on some parts of Campania where there are dark soil uh, uh, from volcanic soil. They're baked in the sun, yet the wine is very refreshing. Something that Chardonnay would not do sure. in those conditions. So with that logic, I planted after Vermentino, I planted some piano. I also planted some Falangina, which this one has a little bit Falangina blended in. And that was it, really. Uh, of course, you have uh, to create, to produce a, 
a great wine in general, you, you cannot be too demanding on your vines. You know, you have to give them so much work to, 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 to ripen. Mm -hmm. And so we're very careful to balance the, the load of grapes we, we give to each vine, thinking which wine to the wine we're gonna produce. Mm -hmm. Another thing is important uh, to know is that uh, we strictly ferment in stainless steel. We leave the wine uh, actually on its sleeve or its sediment for several months, up to 11 months. We bottle and then we always take a point to leave at least the wine in bottle for four or five months. So the 27 Tiano we end up releasing early in 2019. And that's uh, that is, you cannot rush a great bottle of wine. You know, Campania is one of only three regions in Italy I have not been to. Mm. Do you know I lived in Italy? Yep. In Florence. And I got to travel all around because we didn't I didn't have any money. So I would just get on the train every weekend. But I got to every but I have not been to Puglia either. And uh, it's on the list. Go see the truly. So, so if you're, wine for seafood. Yeah, I was gonna say if you were gonna pair, if you if you were gonna pick one dish that you could just genie say poof. I say probably what we're having tonight together for dinner awesome. is gonna be a spaghetti with some PEI mussels that are the best from cold waters. So we're gonna have seafood from cold water and a piano from a hot weather. I'm very oh, excited. Yes. Luke is cooking for us tonight in his home. So I'm very excited, very excited. And one more question about, about this vintage. So what was the 2017 vintage like? It was actually among the, some of the best vintages we had in this past decade, along with the 2016 and 19. Uh, it was a, a good growing season in general. We normally have a decent amount of rain in the spring. Mm -hmm. And then summer, actually, it's where at time we have a bit more rainfall. When for us, what is key in, in, this, in our region is true. In every other region in the Northern Hemisphere, it's... Uh, the month of August. Yeah. There is a saying in uh, in, uh, in Champagne, uh, in France, where they say, "Who is le mou?" It means that uh, August makes the juice, mm -hmm. because it's where it's when the grapes they are on the last leg, the last four or five weeks of their ripening is when they produce the sugar, they produce the aromatics, mm -hmm. and they get close to ripeness. If you have a lot of water at that point, they produce less sugar, right. they get bigger. Exactly fatter and the aromatics are not as intense. Doesn't mean they're bad, the one, Just they're less intense. Same thing when you eat a strawberry. You may find a bigger strawberry that looks great, but the little one, the smaller one, the more color is the one that has the flavor. So for us, it's the same, it's the same thing. We get those little native strawberries in the yard, the tiny, I don't know what they're really called, but it's true, you pop one little and it has more flavor than, than a bigger one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so for, for 2017 was a, a, was a season when actually the end of the season, we had very good weather. So we had very good ripening and uh, so. And what's the approximate alcohol level? Of the we, we, we harvest a piano around 13, 13.5%. Uh, it's about the range where we see that the, the aromatic is there, the, 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 the freshness that we seek in its at the, the, acid components are there and it's balanced and pushing it further we haven't done it because I don't think it's uh, necessary as we don't do that either with uh, the next one we have uh, here now. I just want to do a close-up she's a beauty. So the 2019 Barbersville Vienna and the ruins. I love I love the picture of the ruins on the bottle. So Luca did a um uh, Palladio is the, the restaurant that um, is here at uh, Barbersville. We have a wonderful, wonderful manager, Alessandro, yeah. who is maybe one of the most delightful people ever. Cool. And you had a big anniversary yes. for Palladio, 20 years. And there was a dinner that uh, Luca and Alessandro and the Zonian family hosted in front of the ruins. And um, the dinner was beautiful and the wines were stunning. But for me, visually, Luca put smudge pots in the windows of the ruins. So do you know what smudge pots are? Yeah, they're, they're pots, they, they hold about two gallons of molten, uh, melted uh, wax and they have a big wick and they're positioned in the vineyard when there is frost. And they just happened to buy 3,000 of them to, to mitigate the frost. 
And I thought, why not? We can put all these fudge pots around the ruins and they had a beautiful light and a glow and it was magic. And a timelessness. Yes. You know, you felt like you you could have been a hundred years before or a hundred years from now, and it just had it was it was absolutely a great issue. And that's what you feel. I mean, I, I'm biased. I love this place, not just because I was aged here, but I just find you to be so welcoming. And the the grounds are stunning. Um, the ruins add just a, an ethereal, like timeless quality, mm -hmm. and it's just really one of those special wineries I've ever been to anywhere. Yeah. So I thank you for hosting, and I thank all of you at home for for being here. Um, it's just very a very special place. And when COVID ends and you can all come here, please make a reservation at Palladio. It is incredible. All handmade pasta, um, uh, garden uh, foods from the garden, very farm to table. Before that was like a thing. Yeah. Right. Let me tell you who I opened. We opened a restaurant, yeah. which is a great story in my opinion. Is that in 1997, 1998. We had great uh, climate conditions, but it is when also we finally planted in the early mid nineties, some very new uh, genetic selection of uh, grapes like Merlot, Cabernet Franc that came from Bordeaux. They, the plants were sent to the university in uh, Fresno and Davis to be quarantined check make sure they didn't have viruses okay then they were given to nurseries to be propagated okay and they came on the market and i knew about it when i when i came here in 1990 because i worked in napa valley in 85 86. where did you, and I, where did you I, work? I work at christian brothers when okay. they were still existing yep yep sure and then i work also in the finger lakes for six months as an internship okay. so i learned that it was all this new plant material the best cuttings from this vineyard in france in bordeaux mm -hmm coming up on the market. So when I came here, I told the founder, there is this going on. We need to put our hands on because I think that's gonna be the key to increase the quality of our wines here. Yeah. And sure we did. And in 97, 98, we made wine that were so incredibly good that I was <laughs> astounded. I thought it was, I knew it was going to be better, but that much better, I was totally astounded. And I told him, I, re I recall, Say now we have a world class wine. I think I really think we do. It, the problem is going to be we have to sell it, yeah. and I don't believe it's going to work. Uh, posting big advertising and uh, on magazines. I think we have to create an experience around this wine, and we need to open a great restaurant. And now uh, that's how Palladio was born as a restaurant. And through this past two decades, we received thousands of people, and here they had a great experience of food, wine, hospitality, landscapes. And so we have thousands of ambassadors throughout the whole world that are now sharing about this place. And, and that's my mission. It's, it's continuing doing this. How would you describe the food of Claudia? It's actually a wine. It's, uh, it's, it's wine friendly, number one. Yeah. So uh, we never have excessive use of certain aromatics that maybe overcome the wine. And also it's definitely inspired by the, uh, an Italian, uh, the Italian cuisine. The approach of Italian cuisine for us is researching, is like searching the best ingredient. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's the very important thing. Uh, one of the ingredients, for example, that we really search at a great length that we actually import from an Italian state is olive oil. Oh. We produce olive oil in three of the states in Tuscany, Puglia, and Sicily. That is the, one of the basic of Italian cooking, great Parmigiano Reggiano, although at the same time, as uh, the as the, the wealth of, uh, of products in the U.S. is growing, we are now using a tremendous amount of local great cheeses, charcuteries, uh, great um, other product from the Chesapeake Bay. Yeah. When Italians come here, they see those social crap; they go crazy because wow. they don't have them there. They have some; they're little. Yeah. So anyway, so really, as uh, as been, uh, I I really think I've been able to witness. Uh, uh, a really a food and wine revolution in Virginia because it, it, it when I came in ninety it was not that it was not there yet that's sure. really wine culture yeah there were very few great restaurants and it, the great wines were barely existing there were not much there so today we have a wealth of uh, this land is, is so generous it's so much potential and now it's flourishing because of the passion of people so uh, speaking of soft shell crab which I actually really like the Yang yes. Um, 
William Holby, who is the cameraman tonight, is a previous employee of Calvert Woodley, I, a very uh, famous previous employee. And now he is a part, uh, partner at uh, Broadbent Selections. He uh, works with Bartholomew Broadbent, who represents Luca and Barbersville in the US. Um, and William Holby and I were co-workers and the best iteration of soft shell crab in the world is Peter Paston, who owns Two Amy's, formerly mm -hmm. Ovalesque. And William and I used to have meetings at Two Amy's once a month for eight years, maybe. Don't rub it in. And William, I have never seen happier than when he would take a bite of Peter Paskin's soft shell crab sandwich. William, is there anything that tastes better than that? There's absolutely nothing that tastes better. And I can't wait to sit down at Two Amy's <laughs> after COVID is over and he reopens. I know. So cheers to that. Cheers. Do you want to describe that soft shell um, sandwich at, as we're sipping this VA? He has, um, he does this great aioli. You can't see me, which is on purpose, but we can see you. you uh, there, um, there's this great aioli and they're like perfect uh, bread that is just like has a great crunch on the outside. Mm -hmm. Um, and the soft shells are fried perfectly and they're like, lightly battered. they're just they're very lightly, lightly battered. battered. Yeah. It's, and it's real messy, which is a sign of a good sandwich. So I would actually love to snap my fingers and have that right now with this. Yeah. Luca, I'm going to, I'm going to embarrass you. So I want you to pick up your glass of DNA. Yes. I'm going to pour you a little more. Yep. Yeah. And I want William to zoom in. I want you to close your eyes and, and describe the aromatics. So Viognier is by far one of the most aromatic grape varieties in the world. It's a thicker skinned white grape. Yeah. It's one of the only white grapes with tannin. Yeah. And it is famous. Especially on the skin. For either being really good or really bad, yeah. right? So. We want your we want your eyes closed. We want the poet. We're, we're, we're what, we want you to tell us what you smell. I uh, I we're not doing it. No, it's okay. I like, I like challenges. No, uh, Viognier, uh, our Viognier since 1997, the first vintage, was purposely purposefully uh, picked a bit ahead of what other vineyard were doing, especially. In the in the West Coast, Santa Barbara area, they, they were heavy there. A few other vineyards were starting in Virginia. It's a grape that actually very easily goes way up in alcohol, producing a lot of sugars. Mm -hmm. And as it goes up in sugar for 14, 15, 15 and a half percent, alcohol. it has a very intense apricot and peach and mango. And the wine becomes so luscious, almost like a perfume. Right. But at the same time, the alcohol is so high that the wine is a sweetness, a richness. And I never found, I found it very attractive in the aromatics, but I found it very uh, um, uh, tiring and not refreshing and not revolving, not heavy. as interesting heavy. and heavy. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I probably should uh, look into, into picking it earlier. And so 1997, we picked earlier. And then after that, we have to tune in the time of picking. After a few years, basically, I figured that by picking it earlier, I actually can capture from the Unier a lot of floral aromatics right at the beginning, so even some citrus aromatics. I'm going to close my eyes if I Some citrus aromatics. And actually, uh, also a little bit of, of, of peach or a little bit of uh, apricot. apricot. But it's not dominant and I really like to have a wine that has more dimension more characteristic than just driven by a single aromatic number one number two it's immediately it has a very refreshing I get almost like a clear lime yeah kind of like a, which is not not necessarily something I would normally say for you yeah. man, but there is a citrus it, component it's actually uh, it's actually to a point where if you don't know if it is Viognier, you may actually think it could be another variety. Do you get a little lychee? Because, yeah, sure. <clears throat> so by doing that, I really adapted Viognier to our climate. Because I believe in making wine that have balance. And on, on a white wine, I, I want. In, intense aromatic, I want some minerality, I want some freshness. 
and there was some length of, of, of this. And here you have all of these things. The wine actually is a generous 13, 13.5 alcohol. Is it really? Yes. You, I mean, I don't know about you all tasting at home, but this does not come across no. like a 13, 13 and a half percent alcohol uh, white wine. Is fermented 100% stainless steel. Yep. 100% stainless steel. Almost 12 months, just before harvest of this year, we will be battering 2020, just a week or so before harvest. Mm -hmm. It stays on the bottle all the way to the spring of 2022. So you have to give time, you have to give aging, the yeast, uh, uh, the sediment, the yeast, they give the richness. Yeah. So the, the, all the riches of this wine is from actually mainly from the yeast. I'm going to interrupt. Okay. Dry. So today at lunch, um, I was describing uh, to uh, one of the guests here that's with us. Um, why and how uh, aging on the leaves, aging on the dead yeast cells, uh, changes the wine and affects the wine and how, how the end product tastes. And Luca very graciously interrupted me and he added something that I have never in my 19 years of selling wine heard. Can you explain to the folks at home um, the, the benefits of extended leaves aging and, and why physiologically that occurred? It, it, it is actually quite simple to understand is that uh, there are trillions of yeast cells in fermentation in the wine. They multiply very rapidly. So from a small amount of yeast, you end up with a very fairly thick biomass of an inch or two inch in the bottom of the tank, it is a plus a thousand gallon tank. That is mainly yeast cells that are still actually alive. As they don't have any more sugar to feed, they go dormant, they die. But, and then the membrane becomes so brittle that it breaks and the content that is inside the membrane, which is actually the, the, the all, all different cytoplasm and, and the nuclei, all of it is then, then goes into the wine and we stir the leaves. Some of these compounds are soluble, some are not. The ones are not soluble. They sediment, but some are soluble. And they actually give a very important textural feel when you drink them. And that's what makes great champagne. That's what makes great wines, white wines that age for years on the leaves. So time, it's very important to produce a wine like this. All the softness, again, it's from the yeast. It's not, it, the wine is bone dry actually, but it has a nice gentle lift. Mm -hmm. of uh, a little bit of aromatic, but mainly is in the texture. And we're going to move on to the red wine now. So we're going to uh, talk about the 2019 Cab Franc. So since both the, 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 the Viognier and the Cabernet Franc are 2019, can you talk a little bit about the vintage, the year before yes. our whole life changed? I mean, you don't yeah, have to talk nine, about nine, that. But. 19 happened to be a, 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 a winemaker's delight and great growers delight, really. Mm -hmm. uh, we had such great weather through the season, uh, especially at harvest, we have basically no rain. We could just uh, plan our picking schedule 10 days ahead, there was no rain in the forecast. We pick everything at prime condition. It was a warm season, not hot, but it was warm. So e easy vintage for a great grower. And, uh, and that's where you, the really great wines are made. And uh, so uh, Cabernet Franc here uh, at Barbrazil has been grown since 1990, sorry, we start growing Cabernet Franc here in 1977. So it's a grape I found first time in 1990 when I came. Prior, we started in the vineyard yeah, today. Prior to my arrival was always blended with Cabernet Sauvignon. Okay. Although I started, uh, uh, fermenting it separately in 1991. Great season, the wine was quite good, as good as Cabernet Sauvignon. 92 was an adverse weather condition. It was actually a, a mediocre vintage. The best wine we produced, that vintage was Cabernet Franc. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I told our founder, this is what you're, we're gonna plant, and this is what we're gonna base as one of our founding varietals for this estate. And that was what year? In 1992. Uh, and I bought the Cabernet Franc as a variety in 92 as well. You started in 92. Yeah. You were so far ahead yes. of the, um, uh, this year, you know, I had the opportunity, I was tapped to judge the finalist round of the Governor's Cup. 
before that I was just like a normal judge. Like there's like the normal judges and then the finalist judges. And Jay Yeomans tapped me to be a finalist. And one of my takeaways from the tasting, this year we did it virtually. So we taste about a hundred wines blind and write a tasting sheet on every single wine, uh, going through all the different tasting components as well as uh, you know breaking down the wine. Um, the Cabernet Franc flights for me, that they and the Bordeaux blends were the most memorable flights yeah, by far. And that's totally blind. So I do sell wine, but I have no idea what I'm tasting. Um, and I called my husband in at the end, I saved a few flights. And I said, honey, like Cabernet Franc and Bordeaux blends, like this is the future of Virginia wine. Yeah, indeed. Um, no question. And it, it was great for me to be able to do it blind because then as much as I love Luca, it's not taking that emotion. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. just judging the wines objectively. Absolutely. So why do you think Cabernet Franc is so awesome in Virginia? It, it's, a very, it's a very resilient variety. Mm -hmm. It can take the heat and produce wine that are a bit more red fruit tones. Sure. In a cooler season like Cortine, for example, you have more wet current. Sure. And this is not like black bell pepper. Okay. No. So that pepper comes with when you pick a burner plant and ripe when you're working over crop it. Yep. And all and some growers in the in the East Coast, they over crop cabernet plant and maybe it's the pungent, black peppery, offensive. Wines, very, very sure. recognizable. With a lot of pyrazine. A lot of pyrazine, a lot of the green. Green bell pepper. And so here, the style of Cabernet Franc can change in, at our estate in a very hot season like 2010. A lot of red, ripe, red fruit. 14, cooler, amazing growing season. We picked in mid October normally. We, we pick in the end of September. It has amazing black currant aromatic. So that is also nice to have a variety of that evening shift of growing season for this one a different style mm -hmm. but still beautiful the other thing is very resilient to perhaps a, a heavy rain we're close to harvest we have a storm two inches of rain some varieties they really suffer like a little bit of beta suffer san Giovese, which we also grow some it suffered tremendously right and so it adapts really well and even in the frost condition we have seen come on the front in a spring frost, the buds are more resilient to the cold snap than other varieties. So all these things together, it just makes sense for us to basically, my work here has been to experiment, observe, and then implement. I will not just ever plant something, a variety, just because, hey, it's popular. Yeah. Let's plant this because everybody wants it. It's not what you do if you're seriously looking at establishing an estate for long term. When did you start making dry rosé? <laughs> Bob would have started making dry rosé in the mid 80s. Really? And in 89, they ended it was a disaster. <laughs> Nobody would drink it because it was dry. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's like, where is where is And then I yeah. resumed it in 05. Okay. And then actually in 2017, I changed everything around and I, I was, I was using different blends. Uh, each year would change and I would use different parts of the estate. And in 2017, I changed everything and I focused on two varietals. Petit Syrah, which we plant a small vineyard seeking to produce a great Petit Syrah. It didn't really happen. We make a very good Petit Syrah, but not a world class. Sure. So I thought either I pull the vineyard out yeah. or I make a rosé. And I tried. Oh, okay. And so I designated this vineyard of Petit Syrah for Rosé. And in it, a little a portion of uh, vineyard of Nebbiolo goes together. And it made a fantastic Rosé. And now it's, uh, I'm very really happy, very satisfied. Petit Bordeaux is a fun variety. It is. So it's actually the first wine I ever tasted from Virginia at Jim, with Jim Moss. Yeah. For a barrel sample. And just the color mm -hmm. is, is stunning. So if you were going yes. to give me your tasting notes of this Cabernet Franc. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two sentences, three sentences. What would you say? Well, the 19, given the was a a little warmer season. Uh, you, here you have a lot of very, a lot of the black cherry. It's typical of yeah. the front here. There is a whiff of a spice. There's a little bit of black currant there. It's a very young uh, wine, 
as it ages, actually, as you get like eight or 10 year old, the aromatic, uh, you start having some cedar, which is typical from, yeah. from here. Yeah. Still with a lot of the red fruit, which is a little bit drier at that point. And then the beauty of Frank as it ages, you get the aromatics of like mushroom or spore. The tertiary. And those are, those are just very classic. The tannins are always soft, never have a very big tanning like perhaps Cabernet Sauvignon. Sure. Cabernet Franc is about complexity of aromatics and elegance. Yeah. It's not a wine of power or grip mm -hmm. like Nebbiolo is or Cabernet Sauvignon, but it's a wine of beauty, elegance, and great uh, evolution in aromatics. And it's I just captivating. Love it. Yeah. It's a, and it, it can be, it's a wine you can just enjoy, but it's all, it also is a wine that you can think a lot about. I mean, it changes a lot. Even in the few minutes I've had it in the glass, um, folks at home, just give a little a little swirl and, and really get oxygen in there to open it up and kind of age it. And notice the difference between the first taste and after you kind of swirl for a few minutes, you do really get more of that pepper, white pepper yeah. and forest floor. Like forest floor, I like to describe when I'm teaching W set, because it's kind of a vague concept, but I like to describe it as like, you're walking through the woods, yes. either in the summer when all the moss is covering everything or the fall when the leaves have, have fallen and you've had a rain. And that's what I get um, after, you know, the, the, what we call the tertiary characteristics. That's, that's what I get now after I swirl for, for a few minutes. Now, what would we, if, if we could snap our fingers, Luca, what would we pair this wine with? In terms uh, of food? For any any pasta course that has some mushroom in it. Venison? Venison, you can do that too. It's very kind of lean, so you can do that. A risotto with morels or oh. some, some, some with some porcini. Oh, uh, those are those are really a great calling. Or you can have, uh, you could even have like a little, uh, a little a rack of lamb. You sear it and then you do a little bit of a, you have some, uh, maybe you you cook some black cherries with a little bit of uh, Cabernet Franc, you reduce it and you put it on top. So it's simple things like that are great, but this should have some aromatic like mushroom, I really think. And it's, the umami, it's, 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 umami yeah, the umami character. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's great. Yeah, we, um, today I had lunch here and, uh, on the patio here. At William, you do a little panoramic to show people how beautiful. Can, can you all see in the background the, the, the mountain range? It's really special how these vineyards are kind of tucked in a, in, in almost like a cove. What mountains are you looking at, Luca? Well, uh, from here, where our vineyard, they face the west to the Blue Ridge Mountain in the distance. In the ne uh, next valley over is the Shenandoah Valley. And as, actually, as you go up the next ridge, basically, you're, you're starting to border West Virginia. Behind us, we cannot see now is the Southwest uh, Mountains, which go all the way down to Monticello and just north here to James Madison, Montpelier. And we are on the foothills of the Southwest Mountain facing the Blue Ridge. Can we take a walk over here, William, to the end of the deck, kind of impromptu look at the ruin? Sure. So this is the view that you'll see when you visit the winery and you're sitting on the deck outside of the, um, the library. And what you're seeing here in the distance are the Jefferson ruins that Luca described earlier that I got engaged in front of. And I believe Jen Sanders, who is uh, the moder moderator tonight also was uh, got engaged here. It's a very romantic spot. Jen, will you agree? Yes, I sure did. I got engaged there. <laughs> Great men think alike. But you yep. can see the weeping willow here um there there are uh, uh there's a meadow here in between and in the distance you see the jeffersonian uh ruin that we were describing that had the dinner uh in front with the imagine those windows filled with smudge pots and behind the ruins uh, is where the virginia renaissance festival happens right luca no is that not true? <laughs> Are you serious? I was always no, telling it's that. No, it's Shakespeare on the ruins. Oh, Shakespeare. Shakespeare on the ruins. We okay. do. We actually, we do some uh, Shakespeare plays. And uh, we have uh, uh, performances. A, a, a local theater is performing right uh, by the ruins. You have to correct me. Uh, Don't let me uh, tell uh, people like the wrong it's information. It's okay, you know. <laughs> so, um, That's the beauty of being live. I know. It's great. Uh, we were talking earlier. Uh, Lucas done 55 live sessions 
um, uh, your, your what do you call them? Yeah, every Tuesday uh, I do uh, Tuesdays with Luca uh, on our Facebook page, and I, I I cook sometimes. Sometimes in the vineyard. Sometimes I I'm in the cellar tasting wines with uh, my uh, winemaker and my vineyard manager. And uh, I did that when uh, when we shut down in in March, mm -hmm. and I felt really totally disconnected with people. Yeah. And being a people person, I say, well, I have to go to my people, and I started. You and, and I, I do it time. every Tuesday. So he's been more consistent. <laughs> I did what, fifty-five uh, live sessions for it's five o'clock, which was my thing. Same reason. I was like, I'm an extrovert. Like we have got to fix this. Or I'm going to drive my family crazy. I made so many friends, though. I interviewed over a hundred winemakers from uh, around the world, and including you. Yeah. And. Um, I think that one of the things we were talking about is because we both kind of just, we're not tech people and we both just put ourselves out there for out of necessity. Yeah. And one of the things that we said was we really hope that the, um, the lack of the need to seek perfection stays after COVID and that we can just talk yeah. and you can make a mistake and it's okay. And you don't yeah. have to look perfect. You don't have to be perfect. You just put yourself out there in an authentic yeah. way and it's very refreshing don't it you is. think it is it's just like oh, let's just do it right. let's have fun That's how you and the wine fun. industry is full of fun people like very fun people who've traveled all around the world and we tend to attract consumers that are also like-minded yeah that speak multiple languages and that love yeah. life and that want to anything they eat anything they they, they want to experience wines yeah. Yeah. and they want to sit around a table right like 20 of us we don't even have to know each other we can just be drinking wine and we have the best night ever so on that note let's try some octagon let's try some octagon so this is 2016 so um william i hope you're doing that up down camera angle because <laughs> we talked about this <laughs> i'm 43 i need a good angle so cheers luca so this is luca's like epic wine it is 2016 yes, uh, octagon so what is octagon like Oct what octagon uh um, is a wine that I started uh, producing in the early 90s. My, my, my task here was really to produce the best wine I could from, from this land. And what I did, and what I did basically, I at the beginning had to, I could put my hands on grapes that were planted here in the 70s. Some of Los, some of Chignon, some of France. So the first edition of Octagon was done in the early 90s. It was a good wine, but it's not a great wine. As I, as I said earlier, the grey wine came later on in the late 90s when we plant new vineyard. And so since then, uh, <clears throat> we basically have, uh, I have learned a lot. And one thing I've learned is that here on this clay, the most consistent grapes we grow for producing a Bordeaux blend, which is actually a very, very extremely competitive category. It's uh, Merlot, it's Cabernet Franc, it's Petit mm -hmm. Very rarely we have Cabernet Sauvignon in the blend. We didn't even consider Malbec because I know it doesn't do well here. Sure. From other people that tried it. Sure. So, and when some people tell you, you know, I planted that, it didn't work. The more stupid thing you can do, I'll show you how I can do it. Right, you learn from other people. Exactly, and we're yeah. very close. We're very neat. Uh, uh, we're very together as a great grower, so we share a lot of information. But so, and then finally we produce in 97 and 98, the first, uh, what is then later on, uh, consider a work class wine by great wine critics like um, Michael Broadbent and then uh, like uh, mm -hmm. and then like uh, uh, Johnny Apple from the, the New York Times wrote a three page article on on the New York Times in early 2000 saying you know this is this is real this is this is as good as those wine of Europe so served for Queen it, Elizabeth it, it worked and then also the wine was served uh, at some very important occasion when the when Queen Elizabeth came in 2007 in, in Richmond to, to celebrate 400 years of Jamestown, the then uh, go, uh, governor, dear friend, uh, Tim Kaine, uh, called his office and said, hey, we're gonna have to have the best wine of Virginia and the best food. And so they invited Patrick O'Connell to, to do oh, the reception. In a little Washington, yeah. And, and uh, invited us to be there with the wine and it truly is a, it's it's, a, it's a, some people describe it as the most iconic red wine of virginia it, it's historic it's it, it's 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 been there and proven to age we're still drinking some of the uh, octagons from late 90s and they're perfect they're beautiful yeah. 
Yeah. And, uh, and, and beside, we don't produce it every year. Yeah. So we have actually not produced octagon in 2000, 2003, and 2011. They were vintages, was a bit more rain. Yeah. The wine were good, they had a bit aromatic, they were gentle, but didn't have the strength for aging. Mm -hmm. Here is, is a very pure, traditional approach, old school Bordeaux. Yeah. Uh, and even in the in the barrel treatment, we don't use 100% new wood. Yeah. We use only about 40%. I've been actually using only one cooper. Mm -hmm. Who do you uh, use? I use a cooper that is from Italy. Their, their name is Gamba. They go to auction uh, in uh, in the center of France, where they all the barrel cooper go and they buy the lots. Mm -hmm. Of, uh, of white oak and in yeah. between there are other type of wood that the broker then uses for yeah. selling to other people. So I have, I chose the best cooper and I've only used them since 1997. Do you have a custom toast? We do medium toast mm -hmm. and we do allié, mm -hmm. minimum 36 months air dry barrels. But also I keep that specification because it's part of a signature of the wine yeah. and I don't believe in changing it. I want to, I want to, have the best and then keep the and best. And then see how the expression changes because of the vintage. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And so it's a, very, it's a wine of great expression, great integrity, and you can, you can understand the aromatic here are just uh, more magnified, they're more magnified com uh, compared to the Cabernet Franc, it's a bit more depth, more intensity, there's a lot more spice to it. Yeah, the what wine do you is, smell uh, when you smell this wine? I know you don't like that part, but it's amazing. It, this is your baby. So we want to know what do you I, get? at young at young age, the wine has a lot of spice up front, mm -hmm. even even overcoming the the, the, the red fruit aromatics, mm -hmm. and that's actually is tones down as it ages, mm -hmm. and uh, at all, I also uh, aromatics like uh, uh, almost like a rosemary to mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. is a very intense spice that Going. you normally don't. Mm -hmm. Don't use it as a descriptor in wines, but it's, it's so intense. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the beauty it comes then in that then when you when you taste the wine, the wine is it now is tight, has a nice grip, and it's very refreshing, mm -hmm. and is of impact. And then it gets softer, and then it gets very dry in the end. Mm -hmm. But then your mouth is left with a great pleasure. Yeah. And and this is a young wine. Strength and softness. And, and here mm -hmm. is strength and softness in the end. Yeah. And it's a wine for aging. You can drink it now. Now you drink along with some more rich uh, food pairing. Mm -hmm. You eat some richer food with more fat. As it ages, maybe in 10 years, you eat some, you do a pairing with is there a bit less fat in it. Yeah. You go from yeah. a ribeye to like more of a lean. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And the track record is very, it's, it's, it's there. It, where we were earlier is what we call our wine library. Mm -hmm. We have, we're still now uh, available for tasting and some for sale wine from the 97 all the way to current. Are you trying vintage. to sell me wine? I think he might be trying to sell me wine right now because so I only have four wines that in my cellar that I, um, that I, that I buy verticals of multiple vintages. And one is Octagon. One is Vira Bricadello Viole. One is La Rioja Alta 904. And the other is Chateau Moussart. And the reason I buy it is because I love to see how the wine evolves. And really consistently, it is one of the most complex and as Luca said, strong and soft. And I really like that combination. Um, if you, when you come to the property, uh, one of the things that, 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 that kind of reminds me of this wine is like, if you have patience and you buy this wine to age, the rewards are huge. I always want to drink them right away, but this whole property is filled with boxwoods and boxwoods are, um, I'm a big gardener and they are, um, a plant that if you can be patient they grow very, very slowly, but they are stunning. And the boxwoods you have on this property, I mean, they have to be a hundred plus years old. They are about 150 year old, some of them, yeah. And you may have, you must have like a hundred of them. I mean, they're yes. everywhere. Um, so when you come, not only do you have to buy some 
octagon to put in your cellar, but also walk around the property and you just really get the feeling of how, how much history is here. Can we let people peek into the barrel room? Yeah, so is, this is uh, one of the uh, age, it is in one of the aging cellars. And uh, these are the barrels. In here, all the barrels are only the one that will go into our octagon. And they are, like I said, from Cooper Gamba. It's a, it is, I tell people it's a working cellar, even if you only, you see only people moving barrel once a year, so. It's very, very beautiful. We can't go all the way in because we lose Wi-Fi. Um, oh, William is, is doing a close-up of a uh, three liter, um, three liter of octagon. I bought a Magnum today. Oh, you want me to hold it? I'm like a Vanna. <laughs> I'm Vanna. This is a three liter Van. <laughs> of octagon. I bought a Magnum for myself. It's my first Magnum of octagon. So we really appreciate yeah. you all being here with us tonight. We have one more wine to talk about. And I know it's not a wine that you have in hand, um, but this is the 2015 Pasito. Um, Luca, this is one of the most special. So when I see this bottle, I think beautiful. I think um, lush, sweet with amazing acidity. Yeah. Uh, white flowers like gardenia. I've had so many vintages of this wine, but I also think of the red barn. Yeah which is the place in which you make this beautiful yes. wine. So talk a little it's, bit about uh, what this is. I, I, when I came I all, in 90, I, all, I immediately went to work attempting to produce a, a sweet wine using the classic method of late harvest. I left, I left uh, grapes in the field and it was so inconsistent, uh, uh, the results. And uh, I struggled for quite a few years. And then finally, I chose in 2001 to completely change methodology and I use a total different approach, which is the Pasito method that is used uh, in, uh, in Tuscany to make uh, Vinc Santo, it's mm -hmm. used in France to make Van de Pai. Basically, it consists on picking grapes, not, not extremely ripe, but at the, at the point of ripeness, they have good aromatics, but they still have a good tartness. So 20, 20 equivalent to 12% alcohol, just to give you an idea. And so we, we pick these grapes and we put them on crates, plastic crates that are actually coming from Veneto. They use them to make a Marona okay, to yeah. dry the, the, mm -hmm. the, the red grapes. We put them in a barn, we stack them several tons. And then about 60 days later, we don't condition the ambient. We just move air. Mm -hmm. They slowly de hit dehydrate. Do you move them up or They no? almost, we don't just move them. them. Okay. Uh, we just leave enough room in between them so the air can circulate. Uh, and then uh, we just check. Uh, we take samples. When they reach about 42% sugar, uh -huh. we pick them, we vigorously crush them, we very vigorously press them. The yield is four times less than you would have a normal yield. Oh but what you get, it almost uh, it flows almost like honey, it's like a syrup. Yeah. Liquid and gold. then that juice which is actually composed about 50% of Moscato and 50% of Vidal. Vidal is a hybrid between a French and American grape. Very tart, not as aromatic. And that's what the lift is Moscato from. is super aromatic, but very little tartness. Yep. So it's a perfect combination of sweet and tart and aromatic. That's like me, this is me. Perfect combination of sweet and tart. Ask my husband. I, haven't seen, I haven't seen the tart yet. I don't want it's to there, it. I promise. <laughs> So hey, Christy. Yeah. Christy. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I had somebody um, in the group who asked you to please compare uh, the Pasito to a Vinsanto. Yes. So, how would we compare Pasito well, to a Vinsanto? Vinsanto, actually, they tend to extend mm -hmm. the aging up to eight, 10 years, 12 years, 15 years. Mm -hmm. In this case, we don't. We only limit the aging to three years. So it's fresher. So it's a little more uh, fresh. It's not as dark in color. A little in more fact, aromat yeah. um, uh, uh, different aromatic. Yes. You're going to go more towards white flowers right. here. Yeah. Also, some Vinsantos tend to be less sweet and higher in alcohol, pushing yeah. 16, 17%. Mm -hmm. Here you have 13.5% mm -hmm. 
sweet uh, alcohol and 16% sugar. Sure. And I do that by just using natural yeast, whatever are on the grapes. Mm -hmm. The juice goes in barrels, it ferments, but it always stops well before 14%. And then three of the wheat with filter and we bottle because it's very cloudy. Ling Santo is pushing the aging longer. And I'm not looking at emulating Ling Santo. Well, I use the, the terminology color. just to, to give a point of reference. Mm -hmm. But probably then the pie are more into line yeah. of mm -hmm. uh, this. Mm -hmm. uh, of you see this how the pie. color is still golden? A Ling Santo is going to go a little More deeper, amber, yeah. yeah, towards amber, where this is like true, like if you see in the light, this is true golden. You see here, looks like honey almost. And if Santo is gonna go towards amber, a deeper color. Okay. And, and Luca, uh, Luca would you, oh, I was gonna ask um, Luca, what pairing. is the, the pasito, where does the name come from? Yes. With the X's instead of the yeah, pasito. Pasito is, uh, is the name of the method. Although I uh, thought of uh, finding a name I can trademark. And actually in history of Italian language in the 1400, we were what we call the vulgar Italian. Vulgar means it's for the people. Right. Vulgar is the people. There was a use of X's in the language. And so I brought that in just to make it distinctive and uh, you don't and use only X here. in the Italian no. language. Now you don't use J or X. We don't have X's right now in our yeah. language, but yeah. in a period of our history, there was use of X. That's awesome. Yeah. So look at what I really like about this tasting is that you matched your belt to my dress. Oh, I mean, I really think that that is the best thing. And we really appreciate you all being here. This has been awesome. I love Easy. it. Yeah. Easy, and it, right? we actually, I actually, I'm sorry to interrupt again. It's been a yeah. fantastic tasting. It's been beautiful. It's been wonderful to go through the vineyards with you all. Um, I have some people who have asked about maybe opening it up to some questions and some friends yeah, sure. of yours. Let's go out here. Yeah, let's, let's sit, let's here. sit up. Um, you want some wine? No, I'm good. Okay. So if anybody, you can either write yes. your, your questions on um, the chat or you can unmute yourself. Uh, you should be able to and ask your questions and, and speak to Luca for a little bit. We would love that. Okay, so we'll. So if anybody, I think it was Mike and Jan. Did you want to? Did you want to ask him anything? So we we we've known Luca for a pretty long time. I don't know if Luca remembers us or not, but there you are. Yes. Yeah. So oh, Luca, really? Luca said you were here not long ago. Yeah. Yes. We, yes. We stayed in a cottage for our wedding anniversary. That's so cool. Oh, many, many, many. When there years. was Michel Richard and, and Roberto Donna. I had a, had a yes. <laughs> yes, that was many years you know, ago. those guys. That, that was fun. <laughs> and yeah. then you sent us to Diego's restaurant. To, was, oh, my gosh. Oh. Osteria de Sognatore. Osteria de Sognatore, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So we went, we went there in, I think, 2004, a long time. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was, we, we, we had a great meal. Diego, we, Diego really set us up. Like, you know, we, we said, we're yes. brother. like we were expecting you. So he like, he, he gave us like the, everything. It was great. Nice. So yeah, that was the same trip. We met Roberto's mom and we had his sister. We had a, it was a nice trip. But it was good yeah, to see an amazing chef. Food. He's an amazing yeah. chef. The yeah. culture, the, the culture of food, wine, hospitality is, is, is very alive here. That what keeps me happy and going. Cause you know, just making wine, uh, make a big great bottle of wine is not enough you have to create an environment either here but at your own home among your own friends and uh, and do some special cooking and just really it culminates there the, the life of a bottle so i thank you to all of you that understand that that support us and make us uh, uh, uh wanting to keep doing it yeah we will come visit you soon we had um um, macaroni and cheese with uh, black truffles to go with uh, some wine. It oh, delicious. Not <laughs> I'm hungry, Luca. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Luca, I have somebody also asking about if they need appointments to visit the winery. I don't know with COVID what's going on. So if you could just give a little bit more insight on that. Right. Well, we have uh, several uh, combination uh, of tasting experiences here. And uh, per se, we don't have a uh, required reservation although our seated tasting area, for example, it gets quite busy uh, 
uh, every every weekend, especially during the week is not as busy. But if they go on our website and look into uh, people look into um, visiting us and then the different uh, selections, they'll they will find the library, for example. Mm -hmm. And through that via email, we can take a reservation in. We have also the Palladio restaurant. Of course, you have to make reservation today. It was just a Thursday, but it was fully booked. It was in the middle of nowhere, but all the people come and just go on our website, on open table, you can make a reservation. And then the inn, uh, again, we have a nine room luxury inn. It's Do you gorgeous, know like but stairs, it's also- Stairs getting up to my bed? Yes, we there's have. Stairs. We have. We have old. I have to step up to get we, in my bed. We tonight. have old bed styles. This is dangerous. We have, with the we have line, two the steps stairs. to go up. Yeah. Show them the sunset. Yeah, and uh, you know the sun is setting uh, over the vineyard of you know behind me, and it, it's 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 a, it's just a gorgeous place. It's uh, anyway. Enough enough said on that. Uh, I I never. I'm so excited to be here still after 32 years. Uh, uh, I, 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 people actually say, why are you going back to Italy? I say, I don't think so. I go there on the tours, as I say, my mom lives there, but this is, this is my land now. This is my place. This is where I want to be to my last days. Do you still have the cottages available? Um, yes. yes. Yeah, we still have cottages through the farm and, uh, and so many people have been able to escape from the city or whatever. Uh, not able to travel far with a tremendous support from local visitors has been an interesting year. Very yeah, cicadas. Cicadas. Yeah, and we don't have cicadas there. here. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to come in. Um, but we are, we're very grateful for you, Luca, and everybody and Christy and everybody involved. It's just, really a wonderful tasting something I haven't seen before so really really appreciate it and the wine showed beautifully so I hope everyone enjoyed it and is as jealous as hey, I am William. that we're not there <laughs> so. thank you guys so much this was really really awesome really awesome I we really appreciate you spending your Friday night with us we know everybody has a lot of options and <laughs> Wait, it's was it Thursday, Thursday night. It's Thursday. Oh, it's Friday. <laughs> we feel like Friday. <laughs> it's Friday here. <laughs> Thank you guys. This is awesome. Right. Appreciate you. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Thank Go you to so those much. babies. Thank Bye. You. Bye. This is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.